Great, I have 5.30 and at least three members. So we're gonna call the meeting to order, to get this thing rolling. First up is public comment. This is anything that's not currently on the agenda. I have a comment, Trini, it's Sally Penrod. Okay, go ahead, Sally. I wanted to tell everybody that Whoopi, the library is going to open on July 1st. <laughs> I don't have particulars as to what times will be open, but um, we're going to be open and it's just a big thrill. There's a lot to get worked out, even, even though we have a date, there's a lot going on with staff and staffing issues. So there's, there's still a bunch up in the air, but it's, we have a date and we're going to be open. And Thank that's you. all I had to say. Thank you. Next up is approval of the agenda. We just had the one potential amendment, which was to add um, the assembly permit application from the village fire department for July 3rd fireworks. So that would be, if you amended it, the natural spot would be under 5I, would make it 5I3 basically. Okay. Uh, entertain a motion to approve that. Tom, you're muted. So move to approve the um, adjusted agenda. And I will second that. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Consent calendar. We have um, meeting minutes, warrants, and cemetery plots. I'll move to approve the consent calendar. I'll second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion carries. New business. Um, consider adopting the declaration. Recording in progress. <laughs> I have an option to leave the meeting. <laughs> no, you're stuck. <laughs> okay. Anything you say on this, from this point on is on tape. So, just yeah, I forgot to hit record before we started there. So I just I was trying to sneak it in right there. <laughs> Gonna think before I speak now. Dang. <laughs> All right. Uh, declaration of inclusion. That would have been in the board packet. Yep. Any questions from board members? Thoughts? I would actually like to suggest just one more addition to the uh, resolution as it as it reads, and, and that is to insert the phrase, and it could be anywhere in that first sentence, uh, socioeconomic class. So maybe yeah, somewhere at the end of the first. Could be a anywhere in there as long as it's included. Okay. Any other comments? Questions? Thoughts? Hearing none, any motions? I'll move with uh, that we approve with the uh, included amendment that I suggested. Second. You guys couldn't get to it quick enough. Which one got the second? <laughs> I heard Pat first, so. Okay. <laughs> Motion, I was trying to help you keep the minutes, Trevor. <laughs> thank, thank you. <laughs> They, they were quick on the draw on me there, yeah. <laughs> a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Amendments to the land use regulations? I don't know. I know Josh is on. I don't know if I see Sonny anywhere, so maybe Josh would be the... He was not able to be here tonight. He said yeah. Josh had it. Yep. Uh, so I'll talk about that. Um, 
So uh, the planning commission, um, myself, um, and with some significant uh, assistance from Jenny Carter and her wonderful law school students uh, have been working on um, looking at uh, the designated, designated neighborhood development area program with the state of Vermont. Um, and that program is a program that helps to um, create incentives for housing. Um, and in order to qualify for that, we have to, we had to look at our land use regulations, um, specifically, um, you know, through a lens of uh, 20 criteria that uh, the NDA requires us to uh, meet. Um, and there's 10 criteria between complete street guidelines and 10 criteria between building a lot pattern guidelines. Um, and, and you need to score eight out of 10 uh, in each category uh, to qualify for the NDA program. Um, and so once we scored ourselves, um, you know, we looked at where we needed to make changes um, and um, with the help of the law school students um, and coordinating with Jake Hemmering from ACCD, um, we were able to identify um, some changes in the land use regulations that are, um, that you can see uh, here in your proposed, in your packet. Um, there is one uh, additional land use change, the first one, um, which is subsection 107. That was a change that the Planning Commission um, adopted. You can see there's just a slight addition of some, some additional language there, just to make it clear uh, on when a permit, a zoning permit um, is required. Uh, but the rest of the changes, um, the creation of section 314 um, and the change to section 506 D2CI are, changes that would um, increase that scoring uh, of the criteria so that we would qualify for the neighborhood designation area. Um, and, and so this is, you know, the planning commission, we had a public hearing um, last week and um, we, they were adopted or recommended that uh, for the select board. And so now we're, we're looking to the select board to schedule a public hearing uh, to consider these changes. Thanks, Josh. Any comments or questions from the board on the changes that are being put forth by the Planning Commission? Okay, so uh, we need to schedule the public hearing. And I don't believe we have another reason for a meeting. So does it work best to schedule this at the next select board meeting? Yeah, I think that I think that would work. Absolutely. Any opposition to that from board members? No, no. Okay, entertain a motion to schedule this for 530 on whatever day, July 8th. Bye. So moved. A motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Next on the agenda is the Norwich Solar Technologies siting, and I will be recusing myself from this discussion and turning it over to Larry. Warn me, Trini. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let me get to that part of the agenda. Brendan, if you want, you can just tell everybody what your project is and where it's located. Oh, great. I'm sorry if I didn't start on time. Uh, I didn't, I couldn't hear there for a minute. No, um, that, that wasn't your fault, no. and you're, you're good. I was just getting up to speed here and looking at the okay. documentation and orienting myself. So 
if, okay. if you have if you have um, comments at this point, that'd be great. Sure. So uh, in the packet is a uh, a draft site plan for a uh, a 500 kilowatt net metered solar array located at what's known as Zero Davis Road. Um, and uh, it's being presented now on the screen. Um, Davis Road, Zero Davis Road is approximately at the intersection of Davis and 14, um, kind of in between East and South Randolph. Um, this is um, what is a relatively normal category of solar uh, facility in the state of Vermont, a so-called 500 kilowatt array. <laughs> It utilizes uh, between two and a half and three acres of uh, solar array footprint and somewhere between four and five acres of total area, in, including the area around the array where we manage um, uh, vegetation growth so the array isn't shaded and to account for things like uh, access and uh, uh, a temporary laydown during construction. So um, just to um, guide folks very briefly through this particular um, uh, plan here, there are, there are more than one existing uh, logging or agricultural access path on the property. Uh, the specific path that will be used to access um, the, the site for the array will be determined um, by uh, you know, kind of operations and engineering, uh, but the the point is that no new access path will be created. It'll be an, one of the existing access paths, uh, typically um, upgraded or what we call top dressed with gravel to make it um, uh, able to stand up to the couple months of traffic. Um, the uh, couple notable features, it's. Um, uh, it's a hillside property where the elevation is fairly steep uh, by the road. So the area where the array is um, will not be visible from the road. Um, and, uh, and Sonny from the Planning Commission was generous to walk with me up on the site. Um, and the approximate location of the array itself uh, is situated such that it's unlikely to be seen uh, even from uh, homes on the adjacent hillsides. Um, the, uh, we tried to represent here with, and it might be a little hard to see, but there's a kind of a blue line that describes uh, a broader area of where the array, the solar panels themselves, based on kind of operations and engineering, might be relocated. If you think of these uh, as Legos, right? Um, the operations and engineering considerations might result in the relocation of those specific solar panels, but within that blue box. Um, and, uh, and then there's another box, which is a black line with little white squares and that's what we call our, our limits of disturbance. And so within that box, um, the solar array, we might do things like cut trees uh, so that the, the solar array would not be in the shade or uh, do other construction activities, um, and, uh, but not outside of that box. So that's a general discussion. Um, you can see a, just to the right there, there's a ridge line. Um, and kind of full disclosure, I am the adjacent property owner. And so that ridge line right there is, is mine. And uh, so no trees will be cut on that ridge line because it's um, outside of, the, um, of that um, the black line with the white boxes. So um, happy to take uh, any questions that you have. Brendan, would you would you tell me? Uh, I would like to ask a question. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm sorry. Who was that? Uh, Michael Binder, an abutting landowner. 
Yeah, sure. Great. Please go ahead. Um, as I'm looking at that map, um, I'm realizing that the solar panels and the area of disturbance uh, are actually uh, on other people's properties, including ours. Um, now, I realize that the way this map is made, you're superimposing different types of maps. Right. But um, for example, you have something labeled nearest property boundary 50 feet. What does that mean? And it's it's on that box on that box with the white squares. Sure. So uh, thank you for the question and uh, happy to answer. So um, first of all, the, the property line there in the field is relatively well established with a, uh, a stone wall in sections or uh, also sections of wire fence. Um, but the tax maps that are on the um, kind of available mapping data um, don't align properly. So uh, there is a survey for the property. And um, in addition, uh, more survey work will be done uh, during the, the process of developing the array. And what I can tell you is that um, nothing will happen uh, off, off the property. Um, how close how close will the disturbed area and the fence and the panels be to my property line? So there's a, a, a requirement, a, a setback requirement, and that's where the, the 50 foot uh, requirement comes from. That is uh, uh, a requirement in the state. So is that, so no is that 50 feet to the panels or 50 feet to the fence or 50 feet to the disturbed area? So it's 50 feet to the panels. How close so, will the fence be to the property line? So uh, the fence is typically within 10 or 15 feet and uh, we do not always use a fence. Um, so this is an important question. Thank you for bringing it up. Um, the uh, arrays will get permitted with the ability to either use a fence or not use a fence. And, uh, and then prior to construction, we have to notice the state government, which option will be elected. Um, I can tell you my preference, my personal preference is to not use a fence. Um, and, uh, uh, and if that is a, a preference that, that you share, uh, we'd be happy to hear it. Uh, because that is uh, that is an option. It is an option not to use a fence well, at all. Well, I think it would be less disruptive to wildlife uh, movement if you had I, no fence. I agree. Um, and uh, and as you know, there are uh, many, many deer in the area. Um, for everyone else uh, as well, the, um, the fences that are allowed for use are so-called wildlife fences. So there's, they're designed to let wildlife pass through them with the exception of deer. Um, so the, the big advantage here um, uh, to not use a fence would be to allow the passage of everything else, including deer. Yeah, that's a, that's a big crossing area right there for deer. Right, So right. yeah, I would rather be, have them be able to pass there rather than onto everybody's property, including ours. I'd, I'd be, um, uh, uh, Happy to include that um, that preference. I'd, I'd like to ask also how you plan to manage uh, the vegetation. Um, can you do it in a way that does not use herbicides? Yes, we do not use herbicides to manage vegetation on any of the, the projects or properties that we uh, own or operate. Uh -huh. Is that part of the permitting or is that something you can change if you wish? So, uh, I don't, honestly, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, so uh, uh, I could find out that answer if you like as well. Um, the uh, uh, one note in addition to any other questions you might have is that um, as a part of this process, um, when it goes into the state process, uh, you will be a formal abutter, so a party to the, the state permitting process. Uh, which uh, welcomes and provides a, a, a formal um, uh, opportunity for, for all of your input and the input of your neighbors as well. So uh, 
uh, I apologize. I don't know the answer if uh, uh, if pesticides are totally not allowed or uh, but I can tell you that it's our practice not to use them on any of our uh, properties. Perfect. That's good. Um, I have a question about uh, once the project is installed and construction is over, mm -hmm. how much uh, activity traffic um, would there be to the solar site going forward and for as long as it's there? Sure. So there are at least two visits a year. So there's typically a, a spring and a fall visit. Uh, and depending on the growing conditions of the, of the property, um, the vegetative management would happen either once or twice a year. Um, and this property, it doesn't appear to, to grow very quickly. <laughs> what I can tell from the growth of uh, uh, since the logging was done. Blackberry. So, uh, yeah, Black I would say. Blackberries. I would say maximum of, uh, of, of one vegetative management a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, those are the activities. There's vegetative management, which is either once or twice a year, and then um, uh, two inspections. And the inspections are uh, you know, a, a, tech, a tech in a pickup truck uh, who spends um, three or four hours uh, visually inspecting the array. Okay. Um, another question, uh, you know, dealing with installation, um, mm -hmm. it is, as you alluded to, a rather gnarly substrate there. Are you going to have to do any blasting or anything of that sort? How do you, how do you install these? Panels? That's a good question. So uh, what we typically do is um, use a, uh, uh, what's called a driven pile or, uh, type of um, mounting structure or racking structure. And you can't typically drive piles into ledge, uh, so uh, there we typically drill this type of site as opposed to blast. Mm -hmm. So, um, so drilling takes uh, on on a project like this, there would be somewhere around 200 to 220 holes, and that drilling uh, takes about three days. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you for your for your answers. I appreciate it. I have a couple of questions for for the select board, just in the way of, of sort of process, um, since this stuff is kind of new to me. But um, I just learned today that the planning commission had um, already discussed this project and passed on it. But I haven't been able to find any minutes of that meeting. It wasn't. Uh, as far as, well, I, maybe I'm not plugged in enough, but I didn't see any notice of it that this would be discussed. And just as a, you know, as a neighbor, um, I would have liked to have known more about this at that, that uh, when the discussion was taking place at the planning board, uh, even before it got to you, uh, select board for a vote. Uh, this is Josh. Uh... Zoning Administrator, Director of Economic Development. Um, actually, Brendan was on the Planning Commission meeting two months in a row, um, and the last meeting was just last week, and it was a public hearing, uh, and it was warned, um, and uh, so there there was enough notice out there. Were any abiders notice notice separately, Josh? That that's not a process that's required. Well, it would have been nice to have known about it. So I understand, I, just to respond, not from the select board, but for me personally, uh, I'm sorry that uh, I didn't reach out to you directly before, um, if not as the uh, developer, as your neighbor. Um, I know we haven't met yet during the pandemic. Um, I, I guess I sometimes feel like I'm saying this more than once this is an important step um and it is a real step in the process here um, um but uh the uh the state process that starts only after the step uh, uh involves a lot of formal notice uh and 
and, and a formal role for all of Butters. So I just want to be clear, this is um, uh, the beginning uh, and not the middle, let alone the end of the process. Okay, thanks for that. And, and one that uh, you know, I personally and, and Norris Technologies welcomes your participation in. Thanks, okay. Are there other questions? Larry, this is Pat. Mm -hmm. I have the same question I did last time we dealt with one of these and are there any criteria that we use to decide whether it's a preferred site or not? Yeah, and I have the same question actually. I don't, I don't believe we have a, um, you know, any, any kind of a way of making that decision um, formally. We don't have criteria in place. So this was on a case by case basis. This has been discussed numerous times for months on end. Okay, through the planning commission where I was involved in this for well over two years. Okay, and we could have either determined preferred siting or we could have gone this path that we're currently going now where we look at everybody's individual preferred or, or potential location, which then we can say is either preferred or not preferred. So there was a lengthy process to get to here. Now we could have adopted something totally different, but this is the direction we went with and we were advised to go this direction by numerous consultants. Yeah, no, I, I, I know Perry, it just, it still feels, it still doesn't feel, it feels, it feels sort, of, sort of awkward. I, and I completely understand where you're coming from and I, and I don't, and I know the rationale and it totally makes sense. And at the same time, you know, having to decide these on a case by case basis with, I don't know. Well, we can change that. I mean, I can tell you, I mean, I've been involved in this now for four years since Two Rivers Out of Quichi showed up on the doorstep and told us what was yeah. gonna happen from a state level. And we started down this path and we talked about it for well over two and a half years. Yeah. Okay, this is where we ended up so that we could do them on a case by case basis. If anybody wants to change that, <clears throat> I'm sure we could go back and take a look at that, but this is right now, I think the best way right. we're looking for this. Right, and I, I understand that that's where we're at. And, I, and, and I'm not advocating that we that we go down a different path. I'm not sure that, um, I mean, I understand that there are, there are good reasons for not doing that. I totally, totally understand that. Oh, there was multiple reasons for not doing it. It's just hearing after hearing after hearing, and you couldn't get 50 people in your room to agree upon anything. Yeah. So this is where we're at, and that was the consensus of the group after we pulled in some, some, some professional advisors to tell us what to do. So, you know, I understand that there's, it's a state process, um, you know, as the process moves forward, the way it starts is you go to the planning commission, then the select board, and then they take it to where Brendan just mentioned, you know, it's now gonna be become, they'll have to do all the things according to the state regulations. So we don't write the state regulations here. So they're following the regulations. Yep, oh yeah. Could I, could I ask a question to that? I'm not sure if it's exactly the same issue, but what's in the back of my mind is I've been hearing about a project also in development just down just a little bit north of us on Route 14 on the Gifford farm. And I don't know what the status of that is, but I just start to wonder um, how many projects might land in this neighborhood um, without you know, what was just being described, it sounded like you look at, look at each site individually as opposed to looking at the impact of this kind of development over time. Um, there's been a lot happening in Randolph Center. Um, some of us aren't really thrilled with the amount of development happening. You know, we moved here because it's a nice quiet rural neighborhood and that's true for many people. So, you know, I'm not make, casting any dispersions on anything, but I just have to raise it as a concern. I, I think that's a legitimate concern, and it's it's a problem with development in general, where any particular project might not seem to be having a terribly significant <clears throat> impact, but when you look at multiple projects over periods of time that add up, um, then you start finding um, bigger impacts that that do matter. And so your your point is well taken. I, I think it's quite important. Larry, could I address what Perry said a few minutes ago? Please do. <laughs> I don't think anyone's criticizing the work that's been done by the Planning Commission, Perry. What I'm saying is 
I don't have any criteria to judge this by, except subjectively at this point. I would like to see, you know, we have 10 criteria that we look at or two or five or whatever. And if there isn't any in the regulations or in the statutes that define those, I think we should have those ourselves and then be looking at each project based on those same criteria, which we can't because we don't have any criteria at this point. This, uh, I, like, I like solar power a lot. I think that's the thing of the future. Um, but it still has to go through a process, and the process needs to be one that's supportable. You know, we favor this as a, um, a, a approved site because of whatever. Or we don't want it because of, as a approved site because of whatever. But for me, I need some criteria to judge it by. Whether it's not in the statutes, then we should be making up some. So uh, if I may ask, Larry, uh, of, of both you and Pat, um, do you have any suggestions for what some of those specific criteria might be? Um, well, how visible it is how visible it is from uh, other properties. Mm -hmm. that would be and wrong. I think this one probably fits pretty well on that, but um, I'd need to look at that again. I haven't been on the property for years, but as I remember, it was fairly steep and kind of isolated. Those, Honestly, are, no. <clears throat> those are conditions. Th those are some of the things that the Planning Commission does weigh in on. <clears throat> so. And I will share with you that the guidance. Whoops, we're back on record here. Got it. Okay. <laughs> so, anyways, Good. you know, we, we we this was discussed for well over two and a half years, as to how we look at preferred sites. And the one thing we'll toss out at you is one of the things that came up with this conversation was you know the community. Randolph as a whole needed 180 acres of solar to meet its, you know, its quote goals by 2050. So if you start looking at projects like Brendan, and you've got three acres here and three acres there and five acres over here, it's going to be quite a process to get to 180 acres of solar. And that was a projection that was done four years ago. So as demand keeps increasing, you could end up needing 240 to 280 acres of solar. Because those are questions I put to Two Rivers when they were presenting this to us. So what about the growth? Okay, I don't know what the projections are based on. Instead of we needed 180, but my guess is demand's going to increase faster. Okay, then we're going to be able to put acres out there. So it, this has all been discussed, and I, I just don't think this is the place to continue the discussion at this point. Yeah, yeah, Barry. When when this was in front of the Planning Commission, what what kind of process does that look like? Um, this this particular project, yeah, or any of them uh, so far? Yeah, for this no, for this particular one. What are okay, so like? so you know we looked. It's like okay, so so who's who is it going to be visible to? Where can it be seen from? And so that seems to be the key piece of a lot of these projects. Is you know what what's it visible to? You know could could uh, panels be reflecting? You know. Um, reflecting light back against other properties, you know, down the road away from the panel, you know, could somebody five miles away or three miles away on the other side of the hill see something here. So those are all the things that are taken into consideration. And that's how the Gifford project was put together too. So, you know, these are the most recent projects, this one here and the Gifford project. And we thus, you know, we just all looked at the map and kind of, you know, figured out who was around it and felt that, okay, if we think this is an okay site, sure, we'll give it its blessing and then it can move to the next level, which is the select board. And then it can go to the level where Brendan has to go through all the state requirements in order to make that project happen. And that's where, the, that's truthfully, that's where, you know, the neighbors all become involved at that point. That's where they all get to step up to the plate and raise their concerns. So, so the thing, the, the aspect of this that you focused most on was really this, the, the visibility of the, of the site. From that seems to be the priority. That was what the conversations were. You know, every time we'd have these conversations in the Planning Commission, we were trying to come out with whether we do preferred sites or not do preferred sites. It was always who's going to see it and where are they going to see it from? 
You know, yeah. is it going to be visible on the roadside? Is it going to be visible or is it going to be glaring in some neighbor's, some neighbor's eyes? You know, is it going to deter their, um, is it going to take away from their view shed? Those are a lot of considerations that were talked about for that two and a half years. And it seemed like visibility of the project was the most prevalent problem. And, you know, were they going to cut trees and make it more visible to somebody else's project? Right. So, so or somebody else's property. So, I mean, we've been very conscious from the planning commission standpoint to try to, to you know, if somebody comes to the project, you know, so far, they've all taken all those things into consideration. And I think that they've, you know, they've, everybody who's come so far has done a good job of taking into consideration the surrounding, you know, scenic vistas, neighbors, those kind of things. If visibility was the issue, wouldn't it make sense for us to warn a hearing where the neighbors were invited to comment on issues like that? Well, my understanding is that's part of the public process that the state dictates. By then, whether it's preferred site or not, it's already been decided, though, so it's too late to. Pat, you, if you want to, you know, if you want to retask the, the planning commission with this process, and the rest of the board wants to do that, I'm more than happy to take it on again. But that's I where it's going to. Think, have, that's where it's going to have think to start. To the, I think it's up to the select board to decide the criteria. If okay, there aren't any, well, that, that's fine. If you want to do that, then we can work that out. This is Brendan again. Uh, just a quick note, um, and I and I don't mean I want to be very clear. I'm not um, trying to uh, diminish in any way the importance of the preferred siting process, uh, but I just wanted to make a note of the the words that were just used that it's too late. Um, certainly, you can. It there's no going back on the preferred site process but it's not too late during the state process for the input uh, of the neighbors. Uh, that, that's actually um, not too late. That's um, specifically designed to incorporate the yeah, feedback that's when, from the neighbors. That's when, it, that's, when it's, that's when it was supposed to happen. And that's what we understood when we decided to take the route we took on the planning commission level. Right. And so um, there's a, I don't know if, ever, if everybody has, has noticed or not, but there are a couple of um, items in the chat. And um, I think it'd be, it'd be nice if the folks who, who authored those items wouldn't mind just um, repeating it verbally for the, for, the, for the point of the meeting. I think that would be helpful. So Jenny Carter had one, is she still with us? Jenny, would you be willing to talk a little bit about your comment in the chat? I just saw Jenny's chats. Actually, that is true. She's that those are things we looked at also, Primax oils. And and the and wildlife corridor. And wildlife, yes. And so you can't unmute. <laughs> okay. Oh, wait, there I did. I oh, thought I thought it was a function on your end of muting the audience unless you'd called on them. Um, <laughs> so yeah, as Perry said, I th those have been a couple of common concerns. And I was glad that Josh put in the um, in the chat as well about the town plan. I was just trying to look up the town plan where the land use policy G is, but that also seems like an appropriate place for you all to look. Um, and I do always appreciate the work the planning commission has done because um, I've been on it, but isn't it in this process, Perry, you can correct me if I'm wrong because I haven't been involved in this process and you obviously have. Aren't they two separate votes? Unlike a, um, a zoning amendment, which the planning commission proposes and gives to the select board for the select board to adopt. I was under the impression that there are two separate votes for the preferred siting. And I do think, and, and I too, like, like um, uh, um, Pat was saying, I'm a huge solar proponent, so don't get me wrong. And who I work for does community solar. And I think the world of Norwich 
technologies. And from what I've seen of this particular pros proposal, it looks like what we're looking for in a solar site. Um, but just putting on my general policy hat that has nothing to do with this particular project, I do feel what Pat and Larry are saying about, it's hard to sort of say you approve something without at least having in your own mind some criteria to go through. And Josh may speak to what's in the town plan. That seems like a logical place to look, even if they're not formal criteria as having some informal criteria. And I would just say from a, a legal point of view, making a decision without, generally speaking, making a decision without any criteria for which you make it, and you're gonna have different projects come before you, I would think would open you up to more liability for your decisions being arbitrary. So the planning commission, it sounds like you guys had some things that you had in mind. So maybe it's just a matter of sharing them with the select board. So they say, yep, we agree with those things you use, Perry. And, you know, kind of like the, in some ways that is sort of like the zoning amendment process. Yep, we agree with you and we're ready to sign off on it. But I totally understand Larry and Pat's kind of queasiness of not having something to hang their hats on as to why they're voting in favor of it or against it. Yeah, so. thank you, Jenny. That, that's, that actually um, ex expresses what I was feeling um, quite nicely. Um, and so we've heard about very clearly that the sighting visually um, seems to be acceptable. It doesn't seem like, this seems like the kind of best case scenario in a lot of ways. It's hard to picture it being too much better than, than what we have here. Um, and it sounds like um, ag soils were, were considered as well as effects on wildlife. So maybe we could hear a little more about what the Planning Commission found when, when discussing those items. Perry can, or Josh? You can take it, Josh. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, this, this process, um, the meeting that they had was very similar to the last um, years process with Norwich, um, where, you know, the siting that was proposed um, looked at the impact on the aesthetics um, and the scenic and natural beauty, uh, historic significance and natural resources of the areas, um, and um, looked at it from whether or not it could be viewed from um, I-89, state highways, you know, any town roads and neighboring properties, um, and looked at um, how it would affect in a, in a holistic way. Um, and I think they've found um, when looking at it in a holistic way that the project itself did not have an adverse effect, uh, adverse impact on um, any of those um, sort of criteria. Um, so, that's talked about in the, at least the two solar projects that they've been involved in over the last year. Um, and and th those are the criteria that are listed um, or things to, to consider um, in, in policy G in the town plan underneath the uh, land use section. So, so I'm, I'm not familiar with that particular section. Um, when so when the planning commission meets, it's it's actually sitting there with those criteria in that section in front of them and are kind of going through them on a point by point basis um, and discussing their impacts for each. Well, we didn't have a checklist. Um, we did. We went went through this process last year, last March, with another solar array. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think everybody became more familiar with. Uh, what they were supposed to be looking at. Um, and certainly, you know, that was come to the Planning Commission twice last year too. Um, so they were really familiar with the project. Um, and so they were familiar with the criteria also. Um, Brendan did a really good job explaining the project. Um, so they felt they felt comfortable and confident that um, it, it did meet the sort of the goals that were um, laid out. Okay. Thanks, Josh. 
Larry, do you mind if I offer a little additional information? No, please go ahead, Brendan. Okay, just um, on those points, um, such as uh, the soils and the those other criteria, those are um, uh, specifically considered um, in that state certificate of public good process. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, when a when a permit is issued, it needs to address uh, a, a larger set of criteria, including those kind of in turn. And so it's um, it's explicitly part of that process. Um, and, uh, and the reason they do that is because the, the state agencies with um, with the professional um, understanding of things like uh, uh, wildlife and soils uh, and uh, historic resources uh, are the uh, are the agencies that are tasked with making those evaluations. So, uh, kind of bringing those resources to bear, um, and that's that's the intent of the process. Okay, thank thank you, Brendan. That's helpful. Um, you know, as we're, as we're getting sort of more, as I'm wrapping my head around this a little bit more as we as we discuss this, it it, it makes me really wonder, sort of, you know, if 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 they're going to be looking at the, at these issues in this kind of detail in the in the next step, um, you know, and and that's not really the sort of thing that we're really tasked with um, thinking about. At, at this stage of the process, you know, that the select board, you know, I, I'm just sort of, I guess I'm a little confused as to like what the intent is about the select board's role in this process. Um, like what what value are we adding by, by signing off or not signing off on the preferred, you know, on this prefer being a preferred site? Like what, could someone help me sort of think through like what the, the overall rationale is of how we fit into the bigger process, because it so I, under, a, what, under what grounds would we say, "Oh no, we can't possibly do this. It's a terrible idea." Um, well, I, I guess I'm happy to volunteer a, a, a shot at that. This is Brendan again. Yeah. Um, so, so part of it is um, looking at the alternative, which is what existed. Uh, before the preferred siting process came into play. So this is um, uh, you know, back before 2017. Um, in that process, uh, the, in, the entire process was state. Um, and uh, I think um, while, while the preferred siting process might be and it kind of admittedly, as, as I've gone through it several times, a little vague and somewhat frustrating. And, and I know it spurred a lot of effort on towns to try to do enhanced energy plans and other things. Uh, it certainly has achieved the goal, uh, even, even today, uh, in engaging folks early on the local level, um, uh, as opposed to um, a state process that is wholly um, uh, th that's begun um, and uh, and is is kind of less formally including the town so um, if the conclusion is this is a little bit messy and big but we're engaged in paying attention I think that's kind of the intent uh, and and certainly there are some examples where uh, where towns have um, have, have made a very reasonable decision not to confer preferred siting. And it's, um, I haven't seen a case when that was the wrong decision. Larry, I could just add to this some, if you look at the legislation on a lot of these things, the, the uh, legislature views the planning commission as kind of having the vision overall for the town when it comes to development and criteria, how to develop and all that. The select board is your governing body that has the final say, basically. This process is requiring a project to go through the planning commission to do all the review and 
and detail and interaction. And then it comes to the select board to have the final say. It's the select board that has to sign that letter along with the planning commission. Mm -hmm. So I, I, looking at process, I don't know that it makes the most sense for us to have a set of criteria in our town plan that the planning commission looks at and then the select board to have a different set of criteria that we look at to decide if we're going to agree with the planning commission. You know, we've appointed these people on this committee and asked them to play that role and to do all that legwork for us and whatnot. And the reason we have things structured this way is so we don't have to get into the weeds on every little thing that comes before us. So if we trust that these folks have done their due diligence and played that role, then ours is just some questioning to see if we understand what they base that decision on for that project to then give that final blessing. So, you know, I think you see that in a lot of different areas where the planning commission signs along with the select board. And I think that's what the intent is when that goes through legislative language development. Yeah, no, the training that makes a lot of sense. And, and it makes me think about um, really how we get input from other committees and, and commissions that were, that you know go through something in detail. And then we basically ask them a few questions to make sure we understand how they arrived at the decision that they arrived at. And barring, you know, thinking that they did something you know, wrong or were negligent or something like that, that we basically go along with 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 that decision. And this is an analogous process. This is really what is becoming more and more clear to me. Well, my suggestion would be here that, you know, the select board members read this section in the town plan that the planning commission is working on because the select board approved the town plan. And so didn't Two Rivers out of Quichi. So, you know, we painted a pretty broad paintbrush here to be able to get these projects to the next phase, which is where a lot of that public input is going to come from on a state level. And we're not the experts in, in all this stuff. So, you know, we are relying upon the state process, you know, Act 248 to kind of review this entire project. So, and we don't really want to go down a path of picking preferred sites. I can tell you that right now. This Larry, is, uh, I would, sure. I would stand by what I said that I would feel much better if there was a hearing where neighbors were notified, had a chance to speak, and somebody, either the planning commission or us, took that into account. Otherwise, we're just rubber stamping. I mean, that's one argument that I've heard. Well, we rubber stamp what the planning commission does. Well, if we're there, I think there's some reason we're there. And we, we need to be the ones that make up the criteria. We could take some of what the Planning Commission uses or all of them or whatever, but. Pat, at what point do we trust the people that we appoint to these commissions? Like, why would we have a separate set of criteria from the Planning Commission and go through a full evaluation of a project that we've just asked volunteers to do? Well, this is this is all a new process, which I think people are just starting to learn. It may not be that good a process. I personally, like Jenny said, don't feel comfortable approving something without criteria that either allows. Have you read to... the town plan? I have read it. Yeah. And the policy that we adopted and the criteria we adopted under this land use. I believe I've read the town plan, yes. Right, but have you looked, I think some of what's missing here, Pat, is looking at what this criteria is that the Planning Commission has followed in coming to their conclusion. And maybe you need to look at what that criteria is and decide if you're comfortable with that criteria. If you're not, then make some suggestions to the Planning Commission on changes they could make to that criteria or how oh, but, they make changes of what gets presented to the select board in these cases. I would repeat, but, if, if the approval of the select board is needed, I think they need to have criteria to judge it by. If the criteria is the planning commission approved it, so we'll automatically approve it, 
we could do that, but I think we need to make up the criteria. I oh, said this like last night. I said this at the Gifford meeting. So are you okay, asking so we have to rewrite the town plan? Because that's essentially what you're saying you're going to have to do here is rewrite the town plan. No, Perry, Perry, I'm not talking about redoing anything. What I'm doing is saying that the step that we take is based on something and makes sense, and the neighbors have had a chance. They've been invited to a hearing to have input. So, Pat, why don't you take a stab at drafting the criteria you think the select board should consider when we're reviewing this type of application? I would be willing to work with town staff on that. So I think what you're saying is that you're actually going to have to rewrite the town plan and you're going to have to go through that process in order to add your criteria to this. That's just my two cents from two and a half years of reviewing this. I think you're right, Perry. It's going to require not only a town plan amendment, but somewhere we're going to have to end up with a formal policy or document that talks about what the select board is going to review and how it's going to come before them and whatnot, which to me then questions why the planning commission is in there, but maybe I'm missing something. I think you're gonna right back in the same weeds field that you were in two and a half to three years ago. I believe you're correct. Well, it's, it sounds to me like the planning commission did go through a, a, a list of criteria that they considered um, in terms of this site. Um, it's the ones in the town plan, Larry. So, this is Jenny again. I don't know if I can ask to interject. Is that okay with the chair? Jenny, please go ahead. Um, so, I am just wondering. So, so, I did just take a quick look at the town plan. And I will say, I'm not sure if it really has anything that directly addresses community solar, addresses commercial and industrial solar, from at least from the provision that Josh referenced. So I just want to put that on the table because I'm not sure if the town plan really does address it. But I think you're on the right track, though. If the planning, Perry, it sounded like you did say that the planning commission had some specific criteria it did look at. And if they, if the planning commission would just share that with the select board, it sounds like that might be what you need. Now, I think Pat's question about a public hearing is maybe a totally different one that I'll keep my nose out of. Um, but in terms of it, it did sound like, Perry, you were saying that the planning commission did use some criteria and maybe the solution here is for the planning commission to share that criteria with the select board. Because it isn't there, there isn't really too much in the town plan, I don't think. So it sounded like Perry, you said, I know when I was there, you guys asked about, or I asked about primag soils, and um, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank on on his name from Norwich Soil, Brendan. I'm sorry, Brendan. Brendan sort of showed how there weren't any primag soils. It's on a slope. Um, Brendan did say that he had looked at the wildlife. Um, corridors maps and while they're not always complete because we've heard from the neighbors that they're deer, I believe Brendan said wildlife it's, weren't an issue. Correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Brendan. Yeah, so no, I do think you uh, had some criteria you were looking at and that maybe you just need to share those with the select board and that could really go a long way towards resolving this issue. Uh, and then it, and the site, it wasn't going to be viewed. So you, you looked at sort of the scenic implications and it wasn't going to be viewed from anybody by the road. And um, I don't know what the implications are for the neighbor. So it does seem like the planning commission did use some criteria. And I just think you need to elucidate those. And um, Two Rivers out of Quichi actually has a number of those criteria in their um, I was just looking at that. They have criteria that they look at to decide whether or not they think um, a particular project is appropriate. And the couple of other things I noticed they had in there in addition to the scenic was wetlands and how far it was from a river corridor. They just had a few, like they had a few basic things Two Rivers does in their checklist of when they're taking a look at a project. 
So um, I don't think you need to necessarily have anything really formal, but it would be nice if the planning commission and the select board were on the same page. And I'll end there. Well, I think Josh kind of explained that when we started the process. I mean, Brendan's, Brendan's you know, presentation to us addressed all that criteria. So I don't think it was like, yeah, no, we didn't sit there with a checklist and say, yeah, 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 yeah. It was all in that. So when we, you know, felt that, that we'd seen what we needed to see here, you know, it's it's in an area that can't be seen. It's not near any streams. It's there's no wetlands in the area. You're absolutely right. It didn't seem to be there was any prime ag soils to deal with. So I think we kind of addressed that already. Um, is this is Brendan? Am, am I hearable? Are people hearing me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I uh, just one just for for fun for completeness. Uh, it is a mapped deer wintering area, uh, but this is a good example of what happens during the um, the state process. Is there's an actual visit uh, from uh, ANR, and uh, they look at how it functions, how the site functions actually. So they, they do general mapping and they'll look at the specific functionality of that area. And, and as, as we can tell from the, uh, the plan, a bunch of uh, logging had been done there uh, since the mapping took place. And then they will often put um, some reasonable bounds on the permit. So say for instance, if there's a permit to put solar in where there's deer wintering, uh, they'll limit the, um, the time of year that the installation can take place so that it doesn't disturb the deer wintering function. Um, and so uh, that's just a good example of uh, a specific example of how the state process functions and where we take advantage of their expertise. Thank you, Brendan. Are there comments um, or questions? Yeah, Tom. Yeah. I. I was in some kind of Zoom lim limbo land there for a while and um, no one was hearing me when I tried to speak, but I just wanted to address the issue that has been raised that this somehow has not been subjected to sufficient public process thus far. We heard earlier that all of the commission meeting, the planning commission meetings relative to this project were duly warned. Uh, so I don't understand how um, how that allegation can be made. Uh, and I also just want to reinforce that the next step in this process, as we've heard repeatedly tonight, has a robust public engagement component to it that will impact the final decision that has been made at the state level. So I think, I feel like we're getting mired down in a lot of um, sort of bureaucratic weeds here. Um, and I just want to put that out there. I'd like to address that, Tom, just that I didn't say that it hadn't been, the process hadn't been in public. What I was said was that the neighbors hadn't been notified of the hearing, so they knew to come to it. Nobody was trying to hide it. Hide it. it was a public process, but nobody was trying to alert the neighborhood so that they could make their right. comments. But then I would put the question to, to, to to Trevor and Josh, does our current public notification process for these kinds of things uh, mandate of butters and neighbors being directly notified? Because I don't think that's the case. You are correct. The, the only time where we actually send out letters to a butters are with um, development review board meetings. Right. Okay. Otherwise, it's, you know, public notice on the website and two or three different places around town. Exactly. And, in the paper. And subdivision, right? The subdivision is done by the DRB. Yeah, those are all DRB processes. That's a separate process that you notify the neighbors. Any, um, any application? to have you the abutters list gets mailed out for every application regardless if it's conditional use site plan review or subdivision review so any application that goes to the drb um, all of their abutters are informed so 
So this process bypasses that because of Act 248. Harry, can you elaborate on that briefly? So that's, that's the state requirement for these processes. This doesn't go to the DRB. The DRB doesn't approve solar and, and, and certificates of public good. That's not the DRB's role. We don't look at those processes. So when the town plan's written and the zoning documents are derived from the town plan, we're excluded. <clears throat> the DRB is excluded from these type of projects. That's state statute. That's part of why the legislation, Larry, has the planning commission weighing in. The planning commission's role is the vision of the town and how it impacts overall, right, on, on what's going on and then the select board approving. So it has two different bodies that weigh in on it, but they don't aren't required to get a local zoning permit. But I think for tonight, like the the idea of do you know should we change our process? Should we have different criteria? Should we have a different public notice process when the planning commission is going on? Those are all good discussions, but they're not moving the the, the issue at hand. Brendan's application is on our current process and was filed under our current process, um, and so I think the debate over do we change this process in the future is a good one, but it's not really relevant to what Brendan's trying to get done here tonight. I agree. Now that I feel I understand the process better and, and our role in it, I, I certainly feel a lot more comfortable um, making a decision. My, my only thought going forward um, would just be that perhaps when these come up again, that we in, do, you know, formally contact a butters um, to, so that they're notified of these planning commission meetings, you, just, a, just as a courtesy, even if we aren't required to um, by statute. And, uh, and that's my last comment, I think. Other, other folks want to weigh in before we take this up for vote? I, I would, this is Pat, I would just comment that whether or not I vote for this tonight, I will vote no on all future ones unless we have a process which shows that we actually considered something. I think these the people doing this project are probably honorable, reputable people, which you don't know in the future without criteria what what sort of projects we could end up with. Other comments? So I guess I can make a motion then that we'll approve the Norwich Solar Project to move this process along. And I will second that. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All, all opposed say nay. The ayes have it. Just for the record, I recused on one. Thanks for that note, Trini. All right. Now that we're past this agenda item, I will pass it back to you, Trini. I just, I just wanted hey. to uh, say goodbye and thank you, and I appreciate the time that everybody spent uh, discussing this and. Uh, and good night. Thank you very much. Thanks, Brendan. Next up is a much more positive discussion and a happy event, and that's renaming Elm Street Park to Roslyn Park. And I have not heard a single soul opposed to this. Um, so if there are any comments or questions from the board on this, we'll entertain those. Otherwise, we'll entertain a motion. I, I move that we rename the Elm Street Park in honor of Rosalind Burgess as Rosalind Park. Second that. Some, all those in favor? 
Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. What type of public event are we going to do to recognize her? This renaming or un a sign or, you know, unveiling the sign, naming it Rosalind's Park. There should be some type of a very public event that does that. Yeah, when, uh, if I may add to that or, or a comment on that, when uh, the Arts and Culture Committee moved the process of putting Col Paul Coulter's um, uh, sculpture in the main garden there, uh, we talked in terms of having a po an outdoor uh, post-COVID dedication ceremony of both the sculpture and potentially the renaming of the park. Um, I don't know if there are any remaining funds in the um, funds that were raised to, to uh, facilitate the installation of the sculpture, but if there are, one of the things we had talked about was um, uh, making some signage, uh, both for the sculpture and for the park itself upon its renaming. Um, and coincident with that, we had talked about potentially having um, a, a live concert and dedication ceremony uh, in the park featuring a local band. Paul Coulter himself apparently is a musician. Um, so those were some of the things that we kicked around back when the sculpture was installed last fall. Uh, so could we kick this back to your committee, Tom, to come up with what that looks like? Sure, or maybe we could do that in collaboration with Parks and Rec since it's um, uh, since it is is now sort of officially recognized as Rosalind's Park, but I our committee the, the Arts and Culture Committee meeting is uh, is next um, Tuesday by Zoom, and I can certainly ask for this to be added to the agenda. Great. Great. It, it appears in the um, it appears in the uh, action sheet. Uh, relative to this that or I saw somewhere that there was a June 8th presentation at Chandler. Uh, it's in it's in the letter from the Garden Club from Sonny um, that there was going to be a presentation honoring Roz with this Vermont Public Places Award or uh, honoring the garden, I should say more accurately. Does anybody know if that actually happened? Yep. Yeah. It, did. It, did. it did. It did. It did. Okay. We should certainly reference that at whatever uh, um, event we plan for the renaming of the park and the dedication of the sculpture as well, because I know that got written up in the Herald, but I wasn't aware until I saw this uh, this letter that that was happening. Uh, I'll I'll put it on the agenda for for uh, arts and culture next week and we'll see if we can come up with something maybe in a uh, July time frame. Great, thank you. Sure. There seems to be a huge amount of support out there for this name change. Oh, so absolutely. It's great to finally take place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So next up is a discussion on the municipal tax capacity. This was a request from Larry to add to the agenda. So I see he just went off screen. Um, we'll let him explain what the topic was about. No, th this wasn't me. Was municipal? Oh, oh, oh! You know what? It's because it's it's because of the label. I'm I'm sorry. This was me. <laughs> I'm sorry. The way the way it was worded um, that threw me for a loop, and I got I was distracted at this end too. Um, yeah. So you know, there's been a lot of um, talk about the roads lately. Been hearing that on Facebook and from other folks um, that uh, that our roads need attention. And it's not like the select board's not aware of this. Of course, we we know that the roads need more attention. Um, of course, the the problem is that it, it's expensive to uh, repave roads, and um, you know, we're, we're, we're very um, fiscally prudent and we try to keep taxes um, level and um, not raise rates. And 
And we've been doing a really good job of that over the last number of years. Um, but um, there might be folks out there who would be willing to uh, spend some money on roads if we asked them. And I'm wondering if it would be a good idea for us to engage in a process that we can um, work with the public and um, make some sort of a plan and see where, where people are at. And um, we might find that people are, you know, already at their limits and there's not a lot of appetite for raising money, additional monies for, for paving roads. Um, but we might find that uh, people are, um, you know, or at least lots of people, many people, enough people um, um, would be willing to uh, spend a little of their money to uh, improve our, our roadways. Um, but we won't know unless we, unless we ask. And um, one of the ways that I thought we might do this, um, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit, um, is um, there's some now some, you know, web-based software out there, um, which is um, basically it's designed for exactly this kind of process, um, engaging the public, um, finding out what people think, um, um, working on, you know, finding consensus, um, finding solutions to, to problems which can be complicated, um, and, uh, and doing so in an efficient manner um, and in an inclusive way. And, um, and so um, one, one thought that I had was, um, was uh, I actually sort of, you know, introducing you, the, you to the, this, the software, which, which, I've, which I've come across, um, I don't think really is the, a good use of our time in a select board meeting. Um, it's kind of, it's, it is pretty involved, but, um, what, and, and I'm not sure just discussing it is, is, is all that helpful anyway. Um, I think you actually need to see it and use it um, to get a sense of really what its effectiveness could be or how appropriate it would be for our situation. So I just kind of wanted to throw it out there, you know, sort of these, I guess this is kind of a multiple um, pronged sort of discussion. One is, you know, do we want to entertain any kind of discussion about um, whether we want to raise money for roads? If so, how do we do it and how much should that be? Um, and then what kind of public participation would we like to have? Um, is it something more traditional where we have, you know, public hearings and, and note takers and the select board makes a decision? Um, or do we want to have something which is maybe a little more sophisticated and, you know, and technology based, which, which could do a different kind of a job? Um, and then what does it look like when we get to um, the end of that process? And um, so I, I guess I would love to hear what other people think, but before I sort of see the, the, the stage here, um, I'll just say um, one, one possibility is to have um, the select board and maybe some, in, some sort of invited folks um, take a look at the software and sort of give it a trial run, not to make any decisions, but just to, to play around with it and become familiar with it over some period of time. And then we could have a discussion at a later date about whether it makes sense to move forward with it in any kind of formal way. Um, and then, um, and then the other discussion would be, you know, you know, if we do decide that we would like to move forward with something like this, you know, how do we do it? Is it just a part of the regular budget process? Is it something that um, is its own um, 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 item on a ballot for next town meeting day, um, where it's where we get let the public weigh in and um, and so anyway, it's 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 it is a multifaceted. Um, potential work and I just thought it'd be nice for us to to think about this as a group for a little bit and um, and that's the point of this agenda item. Okay. So one of the questions one of the things I struggle with here is uh, I'm not sure it automatically goes to raising tax rates. And I think the discussion ought to be broader, more based on first off, what is the need? I don't know that the capital budget committee has got their hands around where all where the needs are and what that looks like right so going out to the public to talk about raising more money really should come when we know what it's for. Here's our scope of roads here's what they need here's kind of what these values look like, but then i'm not really sure. 
<laughs> that's a step we ought to be taking anyway. And we ought to be looking at, do we, you know, we've heard this money is coming, this 400 and whatever thousand plus whatever the county allocation is to Randolph. Where we should be going with some of this is into the preliminary engineering and permitting on these roads that are identified to get a scope of work and a budget. Because there is a lot of infrastructure grants coming for town highways uh, and for different infrastructure in towns. So I think you're spot on with some of this, Larry, that we need to be positioning ourselves better for how we meet those needs. And the more shovel ready we're, re we're the more shovel ready position we're in, the better poised we are to try to secure some of these grants. And I would much rather be putting the effort into getting to that position than talking about raising property taxes and paying for it all on the backs of the taxpayers. You know, we just passed a few months ago, a delay in people having to pay their taxes and not getting fines and penalties because people can't afford their tax payments. Increasing those isn't gonna make that situation any better for them right now. So I think it's more on how do we position Randolph to be ready to take advantage of this federal money we keep hearing is gonna cut loose anytime to do all these improvements and and make the roads better for the users. Yeah, no, and you're, and you're absolutely right. And, and one of the things which, we, which we'd have to do before we went to, you know, do any sort of public discussion would be to figure out what is our current situation? What are the facts on the ground? And we don't actually have those right now. So this, so actually doing what I'm talking about right immediately would be premature. This would be something which would only happen you know, some months from now, at least, when we have this kind of information in place. Like I know the budget committee and the capital planning committee are also, are both working on establishing um, long-term plans. Um, and so until we know what those look like, um, we, we can't actually, you know, make any kind of decisions. We need to, you know, know exactly where we're at first. And so you're absolutely right and definitely that's something that we certainly need to do. Um, and with all, and uh, that was actually one of my other questions, not for this particular topic, but just more in generally was, you know, how is some of this money that we're expecting, you know, sort of panning out and what can we use it for? And boy, would it be wonderful if we were able to meet a lot of our needs without having to raise additional money. Um, and if, if we didn't need to, um, go this route to uh, to try and figure out how to pay for roads, which people would like to see, you know, not quite so bumpy. Um, there's certainly other times when we might find um, it useful to have uh, a well-developed public tool for getting um, input from our community members. And so no matter, you know, sort of what plays out in terms of um, this particular, you know, set of infrastructure projects, um, it might still be a good idea for us to take a look at this kind of software and see how we might use it for community discussion and outreach on the part of the town in, in the future. I think you're right on the software. I think there's many uses, even if it's the planning commission meetings on solar. Um, <laughs> but the other piece that plays into this, uh, Larry, I think is we have three different bonds that the town has entered into that are gonna be paid off in fiscal year 26. Um, and that's a good thing because we don't have bond payments anymore, but it also opens up bonding authority that the town can manage uh, should we find a larger highway project or uh, some type of uh, capital improvement that we need to look at. I think we've got a lot of tools that are coming up. The key is to figure out what the scope of the projects are and what the dollar value is assigned to those. Yeah. I would add that last night, the Capital Planning Committee started talking about a long-term, <clears throat> not only repaving plan, but also maintenance plan on our roads. 
which would fit into what's being discussed. Uh, they started on it basically last night and are headed in that direction. So that would fit nicely with a longer term um, thought as to how to do what the roads need, whether it's just maintenance or paving. Pat, could you take back to them the the discussion of whether, you know, um, just doing an overlay of pavement sometimes isn't the right solution. It may need to be a full rehab. Yeah, of that's that, what the dis that was part of the discussion last night that um, we need to have the um, knowledge to put into that plan what condition the roads are actually in and that you might not want to wait till roads totally broken down and start over. If you did some maintenance along the way, it would last longer. So I think that's what the part of the discussion was last night. See, Trevor waking his head, yes, he's really on top of this, aren't you, Trevor? <laughs> well, I think when you talk about, I mean, some of this all fits is, is how do you sort of solve for this puzzle? And the first thing, especially with paving, is getting a good handle on where are we from a condition standpoint so that we can then prioritize cost out, schedule, program, all of those pieces. And so that's sort of, you know, that's step one. Same thing with the gravel roads money. Same thing when you talk about sort of um, the pieces that we have really talked about are the equipment and um, big trucks and other things that come out of that same pool of capital funds that need to be on some kind of uh, regular schedule. And can we get into modes where we aren't borrowing maybe, but we are um, saving for those through increased reserves. And I just totaled up, Trini referenced the, the bonded debt service that'll retire around um, 2026. There's some of it sewer. So I think we're, we're talking, if I got the number, I'm trying to do a little quick math in my head. We might be talking about $120,000, at least that I can see quick, just from the bonded indebtedness pieces. Plus there's a few other equipment leases that'll expire either in 05 or, or a little bit after that. Um, so when you think of debt service capacity coming back online, potentially either for direct expenditures, reserve transfers, or, or some sort of subsequent borrowing activity, um, there's a pretty substantial uh, uh, chunk of change that's going to become available. It's just at that point, um, but we'll, we'll need to be ready for, for that. And then bridge and culverts are, are another piece, both on a small scale in the operating budget and then, and then on a larger scale. Um, so I think we've got some prep work to do to try to put all the pieces um, out there, lay it out, and then um, have a plan that we can work toward and implement. But uh, we're, we're on the front end of that curve, I'd say. And looking at the schedule, that that payment amount, I mean, if we just two of those bonds paying off open up $3 million worth of bonding authority. Uh, $3 million is a huge amount of money for road reclamation. And that may not be the only need out there, but, um, you know, I think we need to be putting a little bit more time and effort into this capital evaluation of you know, where are our assets at? What are our needs? What is the scope of these projects and what's the cost? And, you know, again, not necessarily because we need to bond for them, but like there is a lot of projects that are going to be able to be done through grant funding if we're ready to go in into uh, construction with them. And we're not. We don't know what the scope is on some of these roads. At yeah, the bottom of Fish Hill, you put a skim coat of pavement on that, it's going to look just the same in six to eight months. You know, that one needs to be fully reclaimed at this point. And, yeah. you know, what is the cost estimate on that? We don't know. You know, if a grant fund program opened up tomorrow to do roads, we would not be able to apply for it because we don't know what the scope is and we don't know what the cost estimates are. And I, I think we're just getting way behind by not doing something to ask that we start developing what some of these scopes look like and cost estimates. You know, yep, we might have to spend a few dollars on some engineering firms to help us out to do this, but you know, this money that's coming our way would help us pay for those costs to be positioned and ready when these grant funds open up. Mm -hmm. 
shouldn't be the misconception either that it's just the blacktop because when you start getting into those roads you're going to have to be looking at all the ditch restructuring and, and all that riprap that you're going to have to put in because most of those roads all have proximities to streams and that needs to be addressed right away line to right away line yep sometimes so outside question, of it yeah it's got a question for larry so in this software that you're re referencing does that take into account the folks that are not internet connected? I mean, are we gonna be able to pull them to here? That's, that's, that would definitely be one of the drawbacks is those, those people would need to be able to get online somehow. Now you don't, yeah. you, you know, you, it's, it, it wouldn't, well, I mean, so yes, it would be harder for those folks. Um, they can go to the library and, you know, well, there needs to be a metric for them know, to be easily engaged in the process. People, that's that's my point. Is it just people, if you're gonna if you're gonna do a software only thing, there's a lot of people in the community that are not connected to the internet, probably not going to be connected to the internet. So you have to be able to reach out to them, and you have to be able to kind of go back to the old fashioned way and maybe have a meeting at the high school or the Chandler or something and sit down yeah. and have a conversation. Well, and yes, and and you can you can easily incorporate face to face meetings. In fact, the 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 references that I've I've read about with this, that's that is part of the recommended procedure would be to have face-to-face -face meetings where results are discussed and uh -huh. know, where, you, where you do actually get people in a physical room and and talk about stuff. And and you know the the nice thing about the software is that it it's structured in such a way that it 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 really minimizes conflict. It really helps people come to agreeing on positions rather than just sniping at each other. And so- um, Kind of like the R3 process, correct? Um, that was similar, you know, everybody got to throw their ideas, put them on a board, vote for what you thought you needed, prioritize what, right, the, what the needs were for the community. It's kind of similar to that. It the is, software it probably just tracks it. Yeah, I mean, what it, what it does though too, is that, you know, it's, 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 it's especially designed with, um, with, with, I mean, you could use it to discuss anything, but it's it's specifically useful for situations where you have things which might be contentious, you know. Uh -huh. And most of the stuff in the R three process, you know, we we're all kind of, you know, we might have had slightly different priorities, but we we're all basically rowing the same boat, you know. And and this software would would help us out in places where it might feel like a fundamentally contentious issue, like right from the get go, you know. So, okay. so that's where it could be really helpful. And so, you know, it, 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 it'll, it would be the case that certain people would have a harder time accessing it than others, um, but it might still be worth doing if we were able to find, you know, novel solutions to issues that we might not have been able to uncover otherwise. Okay, well, I just love to see it and totally, you know, I'm, I'm a total believer in technology and a lot of things, but I also want to make sure we're going to go back and make sure that everybody's voices are heard because, you know, there's just a lot of people that are not software savvy. Oh, I, absolutely. And, you know, you know, really, you know, one of the, one of my real motivations for even being interested in this stuff is, is, you know, having government, which is transparent and responsive and really you know listens to you know the community and um oh forget i'm gonna laugh about that one okay because they haven't been responsive to me lately but <clears throat> your cohorts hurt up in the legislature over well, there didn't hear well, we... <laughs> we're not going there i'll tell you about that one later so so yeah we have, <laughs> we have we have work to do right and one way that we can do that work is right here at the level of the town right we can mm -hmm. we can we can always do we can always do better there and um so anyway, I'm. This is something that I'm. I'm personally interested in terms of, you know, engaging the the public. And if this is a tool that we could use to get more people engaged in our municipal government, then I I think it would be great. Is it going to reach everybody? No. And no, no matter what we do, we most need a people. Most, we need a mechanism. Do, most people aren't going to want to. But if right. we can ratchet up the level of engagement a little bit, I, that would make me pretty happy. I just on this particular case, Pat would probably agree with me. We probably want to make sure that engage somehow we engage everybody. <laughs> yeah, Larry, my concern on this and coming from over here on the East Randolph side is we don't have all the high-speed internet and connections. 
that other folks do. And so to some extent, you're, you're reaching out to the folks that have the higher technology capacity there. My other fear is there's a whole bunch of folks that are in the agri agriculture community that don't touch computers. And to, you know, there, you need to, we need to figure out a way if we're going to use this for setting policy and getting input before we make major decisions that those folks are at the table in an equal capacity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, and so we hear repeatedly, you know, everything happens in the village. They don't have a rec program over here in East Randolph. They, I got to drive all the way to the village during their hours if I want to vote. You know, you've heard it. I've heard it. Everybody's heard uh, it. This is one more thing that's going to pile on to that belief that some folks have which is, oh, now the select board's only going to listen to people that have computer access or can understand those things. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we just got to manage that part of it. Yes. No, I would emphatically agree with you. Um, I would also say that um, this particular software that I was looking at, if you have basically any kind of web connection, you can access it. It's all text-based. There's no graphics. There's no video. It's, it's something which would be, you know, if you have a a slow DSL connection, you'd be more than speedy enough to be able to interact with this in a in a seamless way. It's um it's very it's very low bandwidth um, stuff. Some days I have no bandwidth here. Yeah, that was my <laughs> point. That's my point is that some people don't have any bandwidth and don't want any bandwidth, right. but still have an opinion. Right, right, and I and I agree with what you both saying, and, and I heard you completely, Trini. I, I really, I mean, we want to be able to have opportunity for everybody. Um, it's just another tool in the toolkit. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is exactly though what it's a it's a really good example of why I included um, in the inclusivity resolution socioeconomic class. <laughs> I agree. Uh, uh, you know, it's it. it, it it totally goes to the inclusivity question. Um, and I, I totally agree with, with Pari and Trini on that score. But sometimes it's not that you don't have access, it's that you don't want access, right? right. To the computers in the digital age. You know, I would, you go and talk with some of these folks who have lived there their whole life and they're in their seventies, they're not going to log onto a computer to be able to talk to the local folks about anything. And they may own some of the larger parcels of property in this town mm -hmm. and pay some of the higher tax bills. You know, my dad owned plenty of property in this town and he would never know how to he wouldn't have been able to log on to a computer to have this conversation. And he, I can tell you, because I did it for quite a few years and I still do, his property tax bill came in a manila envelope. So, you know, when we look at who's supporting the operations of town government, sometimes they're not the folks you think they are. And we need to figure out how to reach them too because the biggest impact is on them. I think it's a combination of a lot of things. So when we get to that point, you know, we can certainly have a conversation about how to involve in everybody. Right now we gotta find out what the number is. Cause I agree with Larry. I mean, so there's lots of people talking about, we wanna fix the roads and that seems to be the hottest priority but we don't even have a clue what that number looks like right now. Or what that scope is. Or, yeah. you know, need the scope to know which funding pots we can go after. And we're just not positioned to go after them. And then I'd like to, to give direction to Trevor to start, you know, figuring out what the scopes of these projects are. And even if it means we got to bring on some consultant help to get the scope and the budget estimates together to do that, because if we're just sitting here unprepared, we're not going to get as much of this funding as we potentially could. Yep, I would agree with that. Anybody opposed to having Trevor work on 
figuring out what these items are and a scope, even if it's with the capital budget committee to do well, the I priority? Think, I think it should be in conjunction with the capital budget committee. So. And I mean, somewhere the capital budget committee's got to get scopes and dollar values to right. help them with, and then they prioritize it. Right, and but they don't the have we can get. Yep, the quicker we can get the scopes and dollar values, the quicker we'll be poised to go after this grant funding. Yep. Good to me. Sounds like a plan. Do you need an official vote, Trevor, to do that or? I'm good to go. If yeah, if you're all good, I'm good. Okay. Do you have any more conversation on municipal tax capacity? Okay. Hearing none, we'll move to considering authorizing a tax anticipation note RFP. So I'm filling in for Cliff, I suppose, on, on this one. This is just the the annual request to, to go out, put that request for proposals out there. This is the funding we use to bridge from, say, the beginning of the fiscal year to um, those first tax installments coming in. Um, in the prior years, we used all of it, I, as I understand, and in some more recent years, we haven't had to use all of that capacity, but it's nice to have it if you need it. So this will just let us go out and um, see what we can find for lenders and rates and all that. So this is an annual solicitation that we do. I move we approve the sending of the RFP. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. All right. Um, water shutoff resumption plan. Yep, this is we just wanted to to pitch it to you and let you let you hear what the thought is. This is as the um, you know anticipating that some of the COVID related restrictions and, and moratoriums uh, are set to expire, including the one related to um, you know the prohibition on on water shutoffs. Um, uh, just sort of laying out how exactly do we get to the point where we shut somebody's water off, and then what are we going to do to to raise some awareness amongst the water and wastewater users that that we're returning to that as a possibility. So you can see there's some suggested language we put in a letter um, that would go out with those bills. Um, so we can make people aware that that, um, that we could return to that shut off protocol. And, and shut off, it's one of those where it's, you have 37 days to pay before you become late and get charged with penalties and interest. You have another, what, 31 days from that. So you're now 69 days from the date of invoice. Um, before we get to the spot where we're contemplating shut off and then from there we can escalate all the way up to and through a tax sale, um, but we don't usually have to get to that point. Um, what this would just provide some notice to users that the, the moratorium has gone uh, and that will resume those practices. And I think it's a relatively small number of users in any given year, um, but uh, um, you know, it's, it's, this is the stick part of the, the carrot and stick equation. So. If you're okay with the generalized approach or everything you want to add, uh, I guess that would be the, the feedback desired at this point. Sounds fine with me. Yep, looks good. Right, Mark? We, we figured the notice would be it, um, rather than just suddenly send the shutoff notice to, you know, send that prior notice that, hey, we're going back to these sort of older protocols. Well, there's at least some forewarning. Did any um, other questions or comments on the change? Any motions? I, I move we approve the change uh, as suggested, as recommended. I'll second, and I have a question. This would be triggered by the governor's lifting the emergency, right? Yeah, it's all tied to the expiration of any moratorium put in place through the, the various emergency orders or any 
other action that might have occurred legislative or administrative, I guess. I think it's just from having attended an, a number of the weekly press conferences over the last several months, I think it's likely this will probably come before the end of the month uh, or certainly no later than 4th of July, which it looks like everything is gonna be pretty much ended by then. So just this over 2000 people. In just over 2000 people, Tom, by today's numbers. Oh, really? Okay. Wow. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next up is uh, the payment process for firefighters. Um, so an update on the committee's work. Um, we have the new personnel policy. I think we updated you guys three, four months ago. The challenge is on uh, any type of compensation uh, for whether it's pay or expense reimbursement or whatnot. The big item in there is um, workers comp at this point. Um, so the, I don't know how much detail I went into last time on this, but, um, if you're a volunteer fireman, the town pays workers comp on your wages. Uh, but if you're injured on a fire scene, um, the, what you're eligible to receive while you're recovering is based on the amount of wages that workers comp has been paid for, paid on totally. Um, so in two of the departments, we have uh, more than one is 50, about 50%, the other one's closer to 60% of our volunteers work in jobs on a regular basis where their wages are not covered by workers comp. So this is uh, uh, farmers private contractors, uh, folks where paying that extra, you know, two to 10,000 a year for workers comp is just not able to be done. Um, so our problem is that they're, what they would be paid if they were injured is based only on those wages that workers comp is paid on. So the town pays them two to $500 a year. And that's what it would be based on. Um, so they're looking at a variety of models by which they may have um, some type of insurance purchase that's more like a accident insurance instead of receiving some type of an hourly wage um, to cover in the event they were injured to help protect some type of income for their families. This has got, uh, we have the Commissioner of Financial Regulation and League of Cities and Towns at the table on this discussion um, because it is much bigger than Randolph. Um, but we have not, we don't have a resolution at this point. We don't have a whole new um, procedure by which to recognize financially somehow the firefighters. Um, so what we're asking for is to, we have, I believe, two firefighters from the village department that do not want to receive an electronic payment. Uh, we're asking the board to allow this payroll to go through with the two of them receiving a check instead of an electronic payment. What, what's the distinction relative to workman's comp between the two. I'm not quite clear on that. Um, so how does the workers, workman's comp issue play into the electronic deposit versus hard check? Um, so the uh, workers comp issue is holding up the new policy manual for the fire departments. And the new policy manual is the manual that says they basically have a choice between a check and a direct deposit. Okay. We're doing a, a different manual for the firefighters um, because they want to re remain as volunteers. And because there was no separate 
full personnel policy for them. They were considered employees of the town. And the strict interpretation of that then means they have to be paid by direct deposit. So I, I'd like to move that we um, continue the board's decision to issue checks to those firefighters. Um, uh, how long of a period is this in effect for though? There doesn't seem to so be they any- they get paid once, they get paid, um, Randolph Center and East Randolph pay once a year. Right. Randolph okay. Village pays twice a year. So this is only for the village firefighters of which so there's So it'll come two. up again in six months, presumably. Yeah, so- It potentially could December. come up in December if we don't have a resolution yet to this. Right. Um, but we also have the ability if we can't get a resolution to this to remove that section of the personnel manual and move the mm -hmm. rest of it forward, which would do this. The firefighters would like to see everything addressed in that one manual. Mm -hmm. And I understand, I get why they're kind of holding out a little bit because that's a big issue. Yeah. You know, we, uh, they, whenever that tone goes off, no matter what they're doing, they drop everything and run, you know, so how do they, how do they go on that call, whether it's into a burning building on the interstate for a call, knowing basically that their family's protected if they're injured. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. right now, you know, we have two departments where at least half of them are not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and make that motion then that th for this payroll period for the village department that we continue with the current um, policy of direct payment to those two via check. Second. We have a motion with no second. No, Pat seconded. Pat, yeah. I thought I heard Pat. Second. It was quiet. Yeah. <laughs> all right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next up is the public assembly event applications. We have one for the parade, one for International Make Music Day, and one for the fireworks. Are we good to assume we can take all these as one or is there certain ones you'd like to single, do them one by one? I think we do them all at once. I, well, I have a question about the parade. And maybe with, with Beanville Road um, closed, is, are we gonna have trouble, any trouble with routing traffic? Or, um. It's Heidi. Um, I don't think so. I can talk with um, the sheriff Scott and see if he if he thought about that or if we have another route. We and we might be able to because we communicate with those. I mean, it's really those impacted businesses sort of that are down closer to the culvert project, and we could reach out to them essentially say, hey, there's a parade from X AM to, you know, from this period of time, that route's gonna be closed. So if you can essentially not schedule um, deliveries pickup, somehow work around that, maybe we can mitigate the need um, for there to even be a truck headed that way and head off any of these potential issues to the extent possible. Otherwise they might have to sit outside the parade route <laughs> until it reopens and clears. Yeah, because won't um, the sort of the normal traveling public will, if they come through town at that time, will have to just wait, right? Yeah, they'll be in the same spot. Unless they can sneak into the parade, they'll be waiting. <laughs> Which you we know, don't as incur. As the parade gets closer, we can make some of those announcements on Facebook and Front Porch Forum, reminding them that the road is closed. 
most of the folks that travel through town anyway know to avoid it. It's not those that we're going to have to worry about. It's the folks that are outside of town and are just passing through or, yeah. or, or whatnot. And, but I think Larry's right that, you know, uh, if you sit near the beginning of the parade, one of your ways out is to come down and cut out Beanville to head back mm -hmm. to Route 12 and head south out of town. Uh, and then, you you know, depending where you're going, you take some of the back roads to get back around. So, you know, they won't have it this year, Larry, is basically the, the, uh, the challenge, right? They won't have the Beanville Road, but that might help us on the intersection with Beanville and 12. Yeah. I mean, all we can do is those public announcements and keep reminding people of the closure and then reaching out to those businesses that have, you know, trucks coming in on a Saturday morning, so. Okay. And most of them, if we reached out to them today, would let those companies know not to come Saturday yeah. morning. Yeah. Sounds good. That was, I just was curious what, what the thoughts were about that. Any other questions on the three applications? If not, any motions? I'll move, move, move three. And I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Stain. Motion carries. We have a draft facility use and rental policy on the agenda that was sent out in advance. Um, any questions on that policy? Comments? Motions? I'll move that we accept the rec facility and park use policy. Second. The motion in the second, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Thanks, Heidi, for your work on that. Thank you. And it's uh, a lot of it was with the, the rec committee with uh, Larry Davion and Kristen Gage. It was a year process and with their help, we were able to get this done. So it's a good project. Thank you for passing it. Great. It also builds a good foundation for adding the rest of our facilities into a structured format. Yes, and, um, and remember, you know, um, now I'm gonna update our software, our registration software, um, we can do our facility requests there too. And so I've already started the summer with the picnic shelter and uh, it's, it's working pretty good. So we can put all the facilities on there. It's one site, you know, and then when we start getting the, the online stuff, it'll be easy to manage. So it's all, all there in, in the software that I use on a daily basis. So it's gonna work out nice. Excellent, thank you. Great. So next up we have grants, a Summers Matter grant. I believe this is just us accepting the grant. Yep, last time you authorized the application and it quickly came through. So this is essentially accepting it and we'll, they've got a turnaround timeline for tomorrow. So we're queued up to, to get it signed and get it back out the door. Nice. Pretty close to first thing tomorrow morning. I move the uh, acceptance of the grant. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstained? Motion carries. Any old business, Trevor? I don't think anything old. Um, that How I about have anything heard. other? <laughs> other business? Yeah. Old or other. <laughs> I mean, I could go through the manager's report stuff and you can see if that's old or other, I suppose. 
Oh, no, we'll give you your own line item. The next line I wanted on the, budget, on the agenda is manager's report. <laughs> All right, I feel very special. Um, we, uh, there, had been a mention, <laughs> there had been a mention earlier of the uh, some of the ARPA funds. They've updated those totals. I don't know if you remember back in May, we were thinking it would be about 453,000. Um, that number's up to a little less than 480,000. So we gained $27,000 or so. Uh, I'm not entirely sure why, other than they've, I think, um, clarified some of the calculations based on that. There's still no word on the county funding in terms of the amounts. Um, there's a little uh, note on the VLCT website that they'll update that as soon as they can. It seems like maybe there's some guidance from the treasury that's changed where um, originally I think that money was going to go back to this, just to the state and then somewhere back out from there. Sounds like now they're going to go a process where it goes to the county structure that does exist back to the state and then maybe back out. And then they've also clarified um, some of the payment schedules. So now it looks like it's going to be um, the application window has open. So we have 30 days from Tuesday to apply for the first round of funds, but it's, they're just split 50-50. So we're talking 240 each time. Um, and the next window will be a year later, which is spring of 2022. And then there isn't really any change in the, the guidance that we reviewed last time. Um, so it'll be one of those where we make sure that we get it. That'll be the focus. And then we'll have some time to, to fully digest um, what we may be able to use with it. Some of those guidelines we're gonna, um, the way they're st structured, we may have to get a little creative in, in deployment, but we have time. Funds have to be obligated by the end of calendar year 2024 and spent by the end of calendar year 2026. So there's a little bit of a window for sure to, to figure these things out and see how things evolve. So it was a good update in that we suddenly had more money coming than, than we expected, um, but we still- Trevor, if I could ask, where, where are those numbers coming from when you get the updates? Are they coming directly from the feds? Are they coming from the state? Where is the- They come, the I think these updates were from, tre if I understood the note right, when I looked today, it was from treasury. The Treasury Department that the numbers had been updated. The, the earlier the U.S. Said, okay, yeah, yeah I, I think I could double check. There's a there's a, um, a section right on the VLCT page. I can go and check that out. I thought those were from Treasury were the clearance because they also link to some of the you know how do we calculate your non entitlement unit funding um, and then. Uh, the other one, Beanville Road's moving along. Um, we're still on schedule. We can't get in the stream early, but there was a meeting on site that clarified that we can do quite a bit around um, the stream in preparation, which should help with the project schedule. There was a little bit of a frightening moment in that they went to begin excavating the um, outlet side. So that's where the fiber, other fiber optic cable had been or still is. And they found three more lines of fiber optic cable. Um, so there was a little bit of a, what have we got here? Um, but it turned out that those have long since been out of use and they were able to remove them and continue with excavation today. The other side, the, the remaining lines that need to be moved are, are just the Comcast and EC fiber lines. And once they do that, that'll clear that whole, whole zone to, to excavate both ends. And so they're moving along pretty well there, um, still on those targets. We've had a few calls about truck traffic um, and speed, and it's been a mix of folks on the open part, um, one or two calls about trucks on Maple Street. Um, and then actually some, a few other calls from um, folks who have been coming from the south and have gone down Beanville Road to have sort of disregarded the first set of signs, made it to the second set of signs, and then decided it was really closed and had to turn around um, right there in one of the, the pieces of private property right nearby. Um, then what else do we have? Uh, pool opening, I think, did Heidi jump off? Yep, uh, somewhere between the 19th and the 21st is what we've been talking about. There were some issues um, getting it up and running. We think they actually have turned out maybe a little better than um, sort of the worst case scenario looked the other day. There was a leak at, there's sort of two lines going up each side, if you remember, and each of those uh, sort of the, the out and the in is the easiest way to think of it. So the little jets or eyes shoot the water and chlorine back in. And so if you go up the one side that wasn't repaired a few or replaced a few years ago, it was that final jet. You turn the water on to turn the pool pump on and, and it came sort of shooting out of the side through the concrete. Um, so we were able to make a small cut, get in there, see if it could be repaired, diagnose that it couldn't. Um, so then we were able to cut and cap it. So we'll be down one jet, but because of where it is on the loop, 
There'll be plenty of water movement, um, chlorine activity. So we're going to be able to open on time, smaller concrete patch, but we'll have to go back in in the fall and um, there might be a way to essentially core out um, and, and replace what we need to replace there. But this will at least get us through the season and buy us some time before we have to do that repair. So that worked out really well. Um, and that was a really good um, buildings and grounds, parks and recreation and water, wastewater all came together um, to help patch us through this. And we even got an assist from, from former building and grounds personnel and, and highway personnel. Um, who knew how to operate the pool or, you know, Bill Morgan actually helped with some guidance on that. Claude, who normally does it, had to leave town quickly for a, a family situation. So we were without his knowledge and, and that complicated that activity. So that was an all hands on deck as it turned out. Um, published the paving bids. We've updated the mass guidance internally to match the state's guidance. Um, we have here in the building a, a, a fully vaccinated set, but we're still wearing masks. We interact with the public and other scenarios and same thing with the folks out in the field. Um, the guidance is that essentially that anyone who's unvaccinated still has to wear that mask, you know, in a vehicle and equipment in the buildings. But I think we're, we're down to a very low number of employees without giving away too much. It might only be a single one at this point who's not all the way through. Um, and then we can start to think about reopening and, and the target is around that July 1st to July 5th timeline. And some of that ties into making sure we understand the guidance as it evolves as we hit the 80% threshold. And then some of it's also just tied to, um, uh, we've got a few people out or who will be out, you know, Cliff will be gone, Ann will be gone. Um, in addition to you know, all the other sort of variables that are in there, then it makes some sense that we can hit it when we fully know what the guidelines are and we're at full capacity so that when we, we open up, we're, we're ready to rock. Um, I think those are the pieces I had on my note sheet here. Hey, any questions for Trevor? Okay. We're talking Thanks, about, Trevor. this is for Trini and Trevor. You were talking about Fish Hill needing more than a layer of pavement, Trini, is that? How's that going to feed into us going out for repaving bids? The, the bid has it as a reclaim and repave. So going down to that sub-base material, essentially chewing it up and trying to do a more comprehensive job. I think the question will be when we see the bids, did, is there enough in that capital line item to actually achieve that level of, uh, of work? And so you have official roads, the reclaim and repave. And then the other project that was listed was Weston Street which is a Shimon overlay with about 500 feet of school street up. Basically when you make the, the corner by the tracks up to that first speed bump. Um, yep. So those are the two pieces that are in there and we should have that for review for that July meeting based on the timing and, and possible award, but it'll be availability and, and price might, might dictate whether or not we can actually follow all the way through. And right now, Pat, bids are all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, so materials themselves are higher. Uh, pavement has a fuel component in it, uh, which is driving that price to some extent. But there's also so much work out there that contractors are not hungry. Uh, so they're bidding high. So, you know, we're seeing very few projects at the state level coming in even close to the estimates. So... That could be an interesting bid to see where they come in at. Any other questions for Trevor? Seeing none, next is executive session. Entertain Trini. a motion to move into, yeah. Trini, ask a question. Yep. Did you mean the H under new business or did you skip that on purpose? We dealt with H on the one I'm hey, looking at. Are you looking at the older agenda, Pat, where it had the wastewater agreement? Yeah, the wastewater yeah, so allocation, heading drive. Yeah, so, yeah, Monday or Tuesday, um, that was removed. There's some resolution to that payments in the process of being resumed. So there wasn't a need to, to go back and, and look at that agreement and do anything any different at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. 
So entertain a motion to move into executive session for labor relations. So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> You're gonna pick it at random because you were in stereo. <laughs> A motion and a second to go into executive session. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. So, Trevor, if you could shut off the recording, that would be good. Yeah.